Hi, today we're back with the lighting controller project and this is the four layer PCB from JLC PCB that I did in my previous video and what we're going to do is solder up the rest of the board. So we're going to start off with these SO packages up here, work our way down to the SSOPs and then finally the TQFP package and we've got various passives around the board as well to solder up but um, that's what we're going to do today. So to start off with, we're going to solder up some of the larger packages with this Sinel solder wire because Sinel is one of the few brands that still has some of the lead solder available for purchase in the EU. This is the SN6040 with the SW26 flux. It's a little bit thick, um, 0.56 millimeters, so we'll only probably be able to solder up the SO packages up here with it, but we'll give it a try and see how it behaves. So there's various ways to solder these SO packages in place. The first thing that we're going to do is just tack the IC in place. So we'll put a little blob of solder on the pad here. Then we can pick the part up and place it in line and just solder it on that one pin. And then we just um, attach the other corner. Right, so now that's just held in two corners. It's quite rigidly held in place. and It's not going to move around. We do need to remake those two solder joints because they're not that great. But now what we should be able to do is just solder up the rest of the pins. So one method that can work quite well for larger packages like this SO package is to place your solder wire across the pins and just touch the soldering iron on each leg. Now I've not used this particular solder wire before so I don't know how the flux in this is going to behave. So let's see what happens with this or whether we need some additional flux. So we'll just use the flux pen to apply some flux to those pins and we can just run the soldering iron along those and just clean them up. When you notice that a solder joint like this one here is causing a little whisker when you bring away the soldering iron, that basically means that the flux has become inactive around that pin. So just add a little bit more flux and you'll probably find that you'll be able to um, drag the solder away quite cleanly. And we'll just try it again on this side, but this time we'll apply some flux in advance and see how it behaves differently. And you can see that's given a much cleaner result. Now we can just clean up that IC and see how the solder joints look. And we're using the flux clean aerosol here so just applying a bit through some tissue and then giving it a good scrub with that tissue and what the tissue is doing is it's absorbing the flux residues if you just spray the flux cleaner on the board all you do is just disperse the flux all over the PCB and just make the whole PCB sticky so you do need the tissue there to clean up all of the mess right so next we're going to solder up these smaller devices so the first thing that we want to do is just put a little bit of solder on one of the first pads. Then we want to do our best to try and get the part as straight as we can. Then we'll just tack the other corner in place and then we can solder the part in place. Now what we can do just to see what happens is trying to solder these without any additional flux. Now what we'll probably see is that uh, with this particular solder wire I don't think there's enough flux in here to cause the solder to wick under the pad so we'll probably either see the solder blobbing a little bit or wanting to bridge across the pins because these are getting much finer pitched they're not as forgiving as the SO packages so let's see what happens. And you can see we're having a bit of difficulty here. So the solution is fairly straightforward. We can apply some paste flux to the pins and clean it up. 
We may need a little bit of solder wick as well. The main thing to note is that if you've ended up soldering and it looks like this, you can always recover the uh, IC and not uh, damage your PCB. So, uh, you know, even if it looks as bad as that, it's completely recoverable. Let's have a look what happens. Now we can see that we've got too much solder on there at the moment. We're just going to use a little bit of solder wick to get away some of that solder. And then we can just run the soldering iron up and down those pins and those should be nicely cleaned up after that. And there we go. Then we can do the other side. Right, next up we've got the main microcontroller. And um, we do need to be very careful in the positioning of this because we've got pins on all four sides. So let's try and get this in place first. And that looks fairly good. So now we can um, try and tack the part in place. And we've just got a bit of solder already on the end of the soldering iron. And there we go, that's enough to hold it in place. And now we can go around and solder the whole thing up. Right, so here's our fully assembled PCB. It's all been cleaned up. I am just missing these two parts here. So I thought I had these, but I've only got the 5 volt version and not the 3.3. So I do need to order those in, but I don't need those to start testing the board. And you can see I've got the threaded spacers already plugged into the PCB. So that means if we need to start installing PCBs into the slots, we can just plug them in and screw them in. So. I'm quite happy with how that looks. That's both sides of the PCB all fully assembled. The next thing to do is to power it up and see if we can get any firmware to work on it. Right, so it powers up okay. Let's double check the voltages. So we've got 24 volts. 3.3. .3. and 12 so that's all in order what we can do now is just put a bit of test firmware on here so i've written a little bit of firmware which should blink the lights at one hertz and also um, try and communicate with this spi gpio expander uh, which should make some of the leds light up so let's try this Okay, so we've got our blinking LEDs at the bottom here. The seven segment display is just counting in binary, but I'm not seeing any of these indicator LEDs lighting up on this side. Let me just see if we can see what's going on with that. Right, so here we have the schematic, and we saw that the seven segment display was working fine, but none of these LEDs are. And it's using basically the same programming to talk to port A as it is to port B. And you can probably see what's going on here. And the datasheet immediately shows the problem. And 
I obviously selected the seven segment display knowing that this needed to be a common anode display and I added the LEDs at another point in the design of the schematic and completely forgot about the fact that it has open drain outputs. So that means these pins when configured as outputs can't um, source any current, they can only sync current through it. So uh, we're fine with the seven segment display because we've got our 3.3 volt connection here through the LED and then the transistor in here is able to switch that to ground but none of these LEDs can ever work and unfortunately we can't just swap the LEDs around um, because this is tied onto the ground plane it's going to be really messy if we start faffing around with um, you know rejigging these LEDs. One thing that we could look at doing is adding pull-ups to the outputs here. It won't work quite as effectively as push-pull outputs but we'll be able to get the LEDs to light up. Now this device does have weak pull-ups and Unfortunately, the datasheet doesn't indicate how strong those pull-ups are, so often you get an indication of what kind of resistance to expect or the amount of current to expect. There's nothing in here. So we can try activating those and seeing if we get any light from the LEDs. Otherwise, one thing that we could do is the LEDs are all on port A and they're all neatly in a row. So we could use some single in-line resistor packages. So you can get them with eight resistors and a common leg, so we could just tie it up to three volts. And then that would work fine. On an SOIC package, the pin pitch is half of what those are typically available in. So we'd probably have to get two four resistor networks and stagger them on the pins. And that would work fine. It'd just look a, a little bit messy, but certainly better than trying to solder individual resistors on. But to start with, we'll try activating the weak pull-ups. Right, and we're just programming now. and they are lighting up, the lab lights are a little bit bright. So you can see they are lighting up nowhere near as bright as any of the other LEDs, which is a little bit of a shame. They do work fine as indicators. By eye you can see them absolutely fine. Obviously the camera is not seeing them as well as any of these other blue LEDs. So this is probably okay for now. I'll look to see if there's any other simple solution that we can use just to tack on to this chip, or whether there's a simple bodge board that I can design to go in this space. But that's indicating that the PCB is working fine, so I'm quite happy with that. So I think despite the issues with the LEDs, which is a little bit of a pain, but I'm quite happy now because what this means is we've got a platform that we can develop the firmware on to get all of the boards working now. And then once I've confirmed that everything on here works, um, you know, I can build up the rest of the boards. Now the PCBs for the actual dimmer module have arrived. So we can solder those up in the next lighting video and because I used the same pick as I did on the breakout board the firmware should run directly on this pick and we should be able to test out that dimmer module really quite quickly. The only thing that we'll have to do is configure these multiplexers. So this page in the schematic is associated with interfacing with each of the modules and you can see on the right hand side here is four identical connectors and those are the connectors off to the modules and they actually all have exactly the same pinout and as I said they can all plug into any um, slot so each of them has got 12 volt 3.3 ground two ID pins so the motherboard knows which module is plugged in and then you can see we've got um, an SPI interface so mozzie SCL slave select and MISO so those allow an SPI interface to each of the modules just in case we've got a microcontroller or some other device that's on the module. Otherwise we can pick between having PWM outputs or just general outputs and then we've got two pins that are just designated as being inputs. And you can see here that these just connect to these multiplexers so the, and the multiplexers allow you to switch between the SPI interface and GPIO on the uh, microcontroller. So we've got quite an easily configurable interface to each of the slots and then just at the top here this is where the um, multiplexer is for switching between each of the ID lines so that we're not tying up a whole load of ADC pins on the microcontroller. So we've got our analog uh, signals feeding in from the connectors here. We've got the pull-ups on this side of the um, design and then these go through to the multiplexer. So the 4052 does actually allow analog signals to pass through it quite happily and then we've got two pins 
that read analog voltages on the microcontroller. So overall I'm quite happy with the progress that we're making on this. Um, overall the project's taken a lot longer than I'd hoped. I was hoping to have this done in around April but um, because I've been expanding it and adding features that feature creep will always get you. I could have designed this and made it really straightforward uh, but I wanted to make it more configurable and add some more features and therefore the whole project's just taken longer and longer. But now that we've got this ready I can just work on the firmware get that done because the firmware is usually the biggest hurdle. You can normally design the electronics relatively quickly but the firmware always holds you up so I'll be able to work on that in the background. In the next video on the lighting project we'll have a look at the dimmer PCB. So I made some refinements since the previous design. It should be pretty robust now. I'm really hoping that it works well and because we can just load the firmware onto here now because we're using the same device we should be able to just sort of plug it in and test it. Then we can have a look at some of the electrical signals and everything that's going on with those dimmer circuits. So hopefully you found that video interesting and until next time, thanks for watching.